to to Maureen Fordham, uh, Professor of Gender and Disaster Resilience at the University of uh, Northumbria University in in Newcastle, uh, and founder member and coordinator of uh, co coordinator, coordinator one or the other mm -hmm. uh, of the Gender and Disaster Network. Thank you, thank you, Tom. Uh, so I wanted to start with a bit of a challenge to the use of the term vulnerable, which might be a bit problematic given the title of the session, but uh, let's move on from that. Um, I think we can see in the zero draft now uh, that gender is appearing a lot more often than it has in the past. But if gender is on the agenda, it's there in very specific ways. Gender is still uh, equal to women, and women equal to vulnerable. And that's not due to an essential biologically determined weakness, but to persistent, entrenched structural processes, highly res resistant to disruption. And we have tried to disrupt them over the years. Um, and there's a bit of a paradox, really, in the, uh, the vulnerability approach, um, which in the 1990s, a bit before that, but when the gender and disaster subfield really started to become active uh, in the 1990s, and the Gender and Disaster Network uh, started in 1997, um, gender and development started earlier, but disasters are always playing catch up to development in these kinds of areas. Um, but at that time, we welcomed uh, the vulnerability approach because it provided an analysis which recognized and made visible uh, the highly unequal gender relations in disasters, which formerly had remained hidden. However, those same structural processes are very effective in appropriating radical discourses and reproducing them in alignment with the status quo. So the same vulnerability paradigm, which had seemed so liberating at the start, began to become a rather constraining structure. Vulnerability is um, I would argue it's an, an ascribed label. Very, very few people adopt it or assign it to themselves. It's a given identity and it has um, a, an identity of inherent weakness. Those labelled vulnerable are those who are marginalised and excluded, which removes them from spaces of power, denies them resources and places them at greater socially constructed risk. Um, and at the heart of that has been a long-running debate around gender and specifically around women, uh, although that has now uh, broadened um, as I get on to. So given that position and that questioning of uh, vulnerability, um, what do we do about that in the context of the post-2015 disaster and development agenda? So I think there's, there is is an issue around naming, labelling and defining. Uh, and rather than vulnerable, I think it's becoming um, increasingly acceptable to use the term at-risk groups. And I've noticed that Tom said it several times. In fact, mm. I'm not sure you said vulnerable yet. Uh, I've been checking them off. <laughs> yeah. um, so at-risk does uh, I is more acceptable. Um, uh, from both ends of the spectrum, uh, really, because it doesn't suggest in quite the same way that level of powerlessness. Um, it's also um, a more politically acceptable alternative than using words like excluded and marginalised. Uh, and so this is a, a, a term that's becoming used a lot more often, um, but doesn't feature as, as much as maybe it could um, in the zero draft and what comes later. Um, there's also an issue uh, to go beyond the binary, the binary of, of men, women, male, female. Um, so while recognising that women remain most at risk, generally speaking, um, we've got to accept that gender is about more than women. Identities of sexual orientation go beyond simple male-female categories and uh, LGBTIQ 
et al. Um, uh, these are labels, um, identities that people have um, uh, a, a give attached to themselves rather than being assigned them by others. So there's an issue of power there that's uh, important to consider. The inclusion of sexual orientation into uh, considerations of gender in disaster is, is a very new area, highly contested, um, and you know, illegal in many countries in the world. So um, uh, you, you're up against a, a considerable barrier to moving forward uh, on that. But then again, we were up against those barriers just to include women at one stage. So um, there's always hope. Um, so we're talking then about moving beyond very simple labels um, to ones that speak to diverse range of interests and needs in disaster situations. But even the category um, women or the category female, they're cross-cut by age, ethnicity, disability, migratory status, um, geographic location, uh, and other factors relevant in national and cultural contexts. And I'm using those, those words because they've been used in uh, the uh, proposed SDGs, um, uh, which has managed to adopt a much more uh, radical discourse. So people have multiple identities, and we need to reflect that. And um, there must be then categories that we aspire to include in disag disaggregated data collection. Uh, and I'm pleased to see that the issue of disaggregated data, which we've been banging on about for decades, um, has, now been, uh, has now reached a level of acceptability. Now, we don't yet know, of course, how that will play out ultimately and what gets included and excluded, but um, certainly there is a lot more uh, uh, of a sympathetic approach and uh, acceptability of that. Um, why do we keep going on about disaggregated data, um, particularly in, in my field, gender disaggregated data? And I think this is a challenge to member states. Do states know who is more or less at risk in, uh, in disasters? Um, without disaggregated data, that's unlikely. And uh, I had a conversation with the uh, deputy um, of the Ministry of Civil Protection in Zimbabwe where I asked her that very question. Do you know who is most at risk? Women, men, boys, girls? Um, etc. Uh, and she admitted that she didn't know and that that was a gap and she was quite keen to move forward in exploring that. So um, once I think member states are, uh, are presented with that as a, as a challenge that they actually don't know where their citizens are at risk, um, that's something that um, needs to be addressed. Um, when we have the data, uh, gender and other disaggregated data, we are often surprised, and, and surprised actually that it isn't always the, the, the typical, the usual suspects who might be at risk in particular situations. Um, we're always um, uh, informed by it, and it always tells us a story. So also in uh, thinking ahead to a, a post-2015 framework, we need to consider the roles that get assigned to women, and they tend to be um, the familiar roles around their reproductive role, their, uh, their role uh, in the uh, private domain of the home. Um, and even though we know that, um, paradoxically again, despite that focus, reproductive health is not routinely prioritized in disasters, but beyond that, we need to go uh, further beyond the reproductive role and recognize, uh, ensure, facilitate, and train for women's leadership roles. Um, those roles that um, many of them are already engaged in, uh, but too often uh, find that they are denied. 
and only to be returned to uh, the familiar images that you see of women in the home, women um, holding children and women crying usually rather than um, recognising the more active uh, inclusion. Um, another important issue um, which uh, we need to keep on the agenda is violence against women and girls. We need to move beyond a, a, a somewhat accepted culture of violence. Um, violence against women and girls, it's, it's an expression, a, a manifestation of power. It's got to be challenged and rejected before, during and after disaster. And again, more recent work has shown how violence against women and girls um, peaks, spikes um, during and after disasters. But those kinds of actions, they, they can't just be nice, uh, nice words and phrases, but we need to institutionalize this practice. Uh, it, it needs to be enforced, it needs to be resourced. And, um, Finally, just uh, echoing what's been said um, by colleagues, it, the importance of coalitions. Um, I think I mentioned that the SDGs has managed to, uh, so far, adopt more radical language, at least so far. Um, and the gender and climate change movement uh, managed to move faster um, than we managed in gender and disaster. So to move forward, we really need to bring those two together to work collectively. And uh, the women's major group, um, which is a broad coalition that crosses over disaster, development, climate change, um, uh, has, has um, put forward its own statement at the Geneva uh, PrepCom 2, um, speaking to the next framework, um, where we echo a lot of the things I've just said. So I end where I began, really, um, the use of the term vulnerable. It's widespread, but it, it needs to be challenged and deconstructed, I think, um, if we're to take forward a rights-based approach. <laughs>